First, uh, I want to introduce myself. I'm uh, Chosen Tang from uh, Nandu University, the Secretary General of IACG. And uh, first of all, I would like to welcome all of you to this IACG webinar series on behalf of uh, IACG President uh, Professor Bin Su and uh, IACG. So thank you for your attending. The ISCG webinar series is a new ISG event. We will uh, periodically invite distinguished speakers in and out of our society to talk about the latest innovations and the researches in environmental geotechnology. So today is the lunch date. And then for the first tech talk, we are honored to invite Professor D. N. Sain from uh, India Institute of uh, Technology, Mumbai. I think many of you uh, know Professor Sain for his outstanding achievements and uh, reputation on environmental uh, geotechnology. Professor Sain has founded the Journal of uh, Environmental Geotechnics and uh, has been his uh, editor in chief. He is a recipient of uh, Richard Feynman Prize 2014 for the best paper published by the ICE Journal and the Canadian Geotechnical Journal Friedland Award uh, 2019 for the paper with the highest number of citations among all those published in the journal in previous five years. Professor Sen is a fellow of India National Academy of Engineering, New Delhi, and uh, ASCE America, and the ICE uh, UK. Today, his topic is uh, environmental geotechnology, the way forward. So let's welcome Professor Sen. Professor Sen, now it's your time. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Chang. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here and uh, expressing my thoughts in terms of uh, what environmental geotechnology was, what it is, and what it is going to be. And that is the reason I have chosen this topic, environmental geotechnology, the way forward. I'm much thankful to all of you for giving me this opportunity. Uh, in short, uh, this is neo geo environmental engineering. The, in, the geo environmental engineering, which is still evolving. I am DN Singh from IIT Bombay, uh, Department of Civil Engineering. So, first of all, I'm sure all of you are aware of uh, the ISEG, that is the International Society of Environmental Geotechnology. And uh, through the, uh, this platform, I'm interacting with you. And uh, some time back, I took this initiative of starting a center, uh, which is known as a virtual center, the SEGARIN, uh, which is the virtual center for geo-environmental research and innovation. And uh, uh, it is my request that uh, you should uh, participate in the activities of the center and then make it more impactful. Now, if I start with the <laughs> journey so far, uh, which I started, in fact, in 1988, uh, that time, environmental geotechnology was not a very well-established subject. Uh, but out of the curiosity, uh, I involved myself and my students into geomaterial characterization. Uh, geomaterial was also a very new term at the time. People <clears throat> were skeptical of using geomaterials because uh, they used to talk about mostly soils and rocks. But uh, this term, when it got introduced, it encompasses everything and anything which is lying beneath the uh, subsurface or the ground. So most of the work which has been done in <clears throat> early 90s uh, was related to mechanical, chemical, thermal, electrical, radioactive, and biological characteristics of uh, the geomaterials. And later on, this concept came <clears throat> in picture that uh, geomaterials could be naturally occurring, like soils and the rocks, 
and the groundwater also, and they could be produced anthropogenically also, the human intervention. So we spent a lot of time, about 20 years or so, in studying how soil contaminant interaction occurs. And this is where we uh, talked about sorption, desorption characteristics, contaminant transport modeling, radioactive waste disposal. Uh, then we discussed about the industrial byproducts like fly ash, converting them into zeolites, which is a good example of mineralogical transformation, bauxite residues, coal washy rejects, LD slag, permeable reactive barriers, sustainable infrastructure development, and so on. And side by side, uh, our activities were also into the design and development of nano sensors uh, for soil moisture measurement, impedance spectroscopy, piezoceramic elements, and non intrusive soil testing. And apart from this, my group has been very actively uh, researching upon the uh, dredged material and the mining material uh, for the mine backfilling, acid mine drainage, uh, dredged sediment storage, transportation, and utilization. So this is how um, I started my career or the journey uh, in the realm of uh, geo-environmental engineering. And uh, now I'm going to show you how this has got shifted towards a completely different scenario and where we are heading. And particularly for my colleagues who are young, uh, this is going to be an, a very exciting uh, journey in the sense that if they can adopt it to their professional activities, I'm sure they'll get benefited tremendously. So here, the most of the time we were talking about uh, performance and responses of geomaterials to the external stimuli. Now, when we say external stimuli, uh, these are all sorts of fluxes. These could be the mechanical loading stresses. Uh, this could be the chemical flux, thermal flux, electrical flux, radioactivity, even the biological flux. So how a material is going to respond to and what its performance would be, uh, this is what we have been realizing since last several years. And very luckily, fortunately, uh, very recently I have published a book, <clears throat> which is a record of my research and professional journey. I'm sure some of you must have uh, got a time to go through it. Uh, this is uh, environmental geotechnology meeting challenges through needs-based instrumentation. Now, this book talks about how different setups were invented by my students, uh, which are very low cost, needs-based, uh, without procuring from the established vendors. Uh, how did we do things starting from the you know, basics without spending much money? So look at this figure where you are realizing there's a small instrumentation. Uh, you can enhance the efficiency of pouring water in the glasses <coughs> just by having two nozzles. Another good example is, <coughs> look at this baby. So baby is very comfortable in the artificial hands and is sleep. Uh, basically, uh, this is what the role of the scientist should be as for the society is concerned. Society should be comfortable because of the uh, comfortable hands of the scientists. So this is the theme of the book and where I have talked about introduction of environmental geotechnology, the nature of the environment and soil and conventional and new geomaterial, which I'm going to discuss today also, how this alteration has occurred from conventional to new conventional geomaterial or new geomaterials. Geomaterial characterization for physical, chemical, thermal, um, you know, electrical, uh, magnetic, biological characterization. So this is what we talk about here. Of course, this is followed by centrifuge modeling, uh, followed by saturated soils, contaminant transport in them, unsaturated soils, contaminant transport in them, followed by intact and fractured rock mass and how contaminant transport is going to occur. And this is followed by heat migration in geomaterials and followed by the response of geomaterials to the electromagnetic field. Uh, frankly, I was not aware when I started working on these topics that one day all these topics will get accumulated and they will come out in the form of a book. But now I feel very comfortable and very happy when this book is, book, book is in my hand. And you can see that this is the outcome of my 20 years of research. And uh, motivation for this work came from uh, Professor H.Y. Fang, uh, who happens to be my virtual mentor. Uh, 
I had been following his research papers, research work, his book, and so on since the very beginning of my career. Uh, for those of you who would like to understand uh, what my research activities have been or what the environmental geotechnology has been so far, I would recommend uh, that please uh, take out time and visit this website. Uh, you go to my web page in the archives, there's a photo and then this is DNS IGC 2018 movie. Now this gives you a very comprehensive idea about what type of developments have occurred and uh, how these developments are being used by my research group and by most of the researchers <clears throat> across the world in solving very complicated problems, which I'll be uh, discussing slightly later today. For those of you who would like to uh, go to the basics of this subject, uh, please go to my lecture notes. Uh, these are all recorded lectures, environmental geomechanics, and this is the nptel.ac.in. And if you click over here, you can access all my lectures just by registration, which is, I suppose, is free of cost. In case you have any difficulty, please do let me know, and I would really help you out. So having done so much, uh, we realized that this still there's a long way to go. And why? Uh, there was a turning point since 2010 onwards, and this turning point is in line with uh, the SDGs, which have been defined by the United Nations General Assembly. And uh, this came in September 2015, uh, where the motive is leaving no one behind. So basically, everybody has to progress uh, together for sustainable development, keeping in mind. So if you look at this chart, which is, which is uh, 17 goals defined by the United Nations, uh, you will realize that environmental geotechnology is a subject which takes care of several of these SDGs. And in the years to come, for the young researchers particularly, uh, SDGs are going to be a big target uh, to focus their research upon. So no poverty. Uh, we talk about the situation where environmental geotechnology can create situation like self-employment startups, <clears throat> you know, entrepreneurship and so on. No hunger. Then, uh, of course, good health and uh, well-being is a very general concept, but quality education, followed by clean water and sanitation, uh, followed by affordable and clean energy, uh, which is becoming a very prime focus of uh, environmental geotechnology in today's context. And this is followed by uh, the decent work and economic growth. All right and followed by uh, the industry, uh, innovation, and infrastructure. This is also followed by sustainable cities and communities. And of course, responsible consumption and production. Everybody talks about sustainability, but here we have to reduce our requirements. We call it as sustainable waste management, or maybe the climate action, which is becoming very, very popular, life below the water and life on land. And the last one, which in my opinion, environmental geotechnology takes care of is the uh, you know, partnership for the schools. So it's a very interesting subject. You must be realizing the whole gamut of activities is becoming so large that uh, several people have to work together from different parts of the world to lay the foundations of the subject in a very, very um, effective manner. So in line with these goals of uh, SDG, uh, what we did is we, were start, we started working on these topics several years back, but now we are trying to formulate our activities in such a manner that they become in line with SDGs. So what is the way forward? And in other words, what are the subtopics which can be explored? So the first thing which comes to my mind is the new materials. The new materials are the ones which are being produced by mankind human beings, because of industrial revolution, because of too much of industrialization, because of too much of colonization, too much of infrastructure development, population growth, and so on. So these are the materials which have been created anthropogenically, man-made. They can be considered as soils also. So the whole idea is, if I can convert these materials into, into uh, the soils, and these soils, if they can be utilized for 
you know the replenishment or creation of the agriculture fields and so on or infrastructure that would be really fantastic <clears throat> so in this context uh, the first thing is industrial byproducts the waste material which is coming out of the industries and the municipalities now the list is very long and the whole idea is and this is where environmental geotechnology takes a very interesting uh, twist you know uh, for shaping up the society and fulfilling the sdgs uh, that is uh, bauxite residues the red mud which we normally talk about followed by the slags which are coming out of the steel making process uh, the ash from combustion the bio mine waste which comes out of the municipal solid waste and the followed by the mine tailings and overburden from the mining the construction and demolition debris or the waste material dress sediments many countries are having a huge coastal line and in case you want to maintain the ports and the channels you have to dredge and the biggest issue is what to do with the dredge material so each of these topics is a big subject in itself and i am sure many of us are working in this area and uh, we are trying to come up with the with the solutions which can make the society better agricultural waste coal wash residues waste rubber and so on so when we talk about the industrial byproducts and the uh, municipal byproducts the whole idea is to talk about the sustainable development and circular economy so i'm sure you must have realized that environmental geotechnology is also going to interface with sustainability aspects development of the society and circular economy so this is a very interesting uh, thought which should be kept in or should be brought to the practice the second is uh, municipal solid waste many of us are working in this area and this is where a lot of uh, activities are to be done uh, you know how to create the material which is coming out of municipal solid waste which normally we call as landfill mined soil like fraction lfmsf or even sometimes the sewage and water treatment plants and sediments you know we call them as sex so each one of these topics which i am writing would require several years of efforts to be made by researchers uh, we have been doing some research in this context so uh, the whole idea is that if you want to stop formation of these type of mountains uh, what we have to do is we have to evolve methodologies for faster decomposition and degradation of the municipal solid waste uh, this is where the degradation comes first in the geomechanics environmental geomechanics where we have never talked about the degradation of the porous media or the control volume uh, these thoughts are actually making the subject more interesting and more challenging uh, similarly when you want to get rid of these landfills what is known as the landfill bio mining uh, the big question would be whatever fractions are coming out of the landfills which have not decomposed over a period of time uh, lfmsf plastics metals can we create composites out of it and these composites creation is going to solve the problem of the today's world because most of the infrastructure requires natural resources which are depleting so these type of thoughts are also very very interesting and very contemporary and i'm sure in the days to come uh, they are going to be a part of environmental geotechnology the second uh, major sub topic in this category would be emerging contaminants so emerging contaminants the list is very big and all of us have uh, gone through the recent crisis which mankind has faced uh, microplastics they have origin from the landfills or different types of activities where the landfills are supposed to be the hot spot of creation of the microplastics antibiotic resistant genes bacteria and how do they migrate in the in the porous medium their identification and characterization what is their fate migration decomposition interaction with the porous media and so on and what are the engineering solutions to remediate them clean up the soils rejuvenate the soil big topics i am sure you must be realizing that a lot is needs to be done in this context another thing which is challenging the mankind is fire and its influence on geomaterial properties so where some initiatives have been taken by researchers in context to the forest fire wildfire landfill fires and the mine fires 
uh, we can think of creating some early warning systems and the sensors. But this is an interesting case of how heat migrates through the geomaterial. So you must be realizing geomaterials need not to be only soils and rocks. Uh, they could be municipal solid land uh, waste also. So how heat is going to migrate through the soils which are lying as a vegetative cover or the landfills and how the properties are going to get changed. All these need to be studied uh, by several of us. Uh, here I would like to bring in the concept of the sustainability. What is the philosophy and how environmental geotechnology take into account this aspect? Most of the time we take out the resources from the earth crust by mining and we extract the ore and whatever is processed in the form of mineral extraction is residue and this is what is known as byproduct generation. A big question is how to transport this byproduct from the industry, where to dump it, how to handle it, where to store it, big questions. You know, these are the questions which have to be answered by uh, environmental geotechnologists. And uh, ultimately, can I use these materials for construction? And answer is yes. But geo-environmental applications give you a possibility where the cycle gets completed and then we might talk about the bulk utilization. That means using these materials, man-made resources, can we produce a facility infrastructure where the millions of tons of the material can be utilized? This is the philosophy. Now, if we can work on this, uh, you know, um, the world will get benefited. And of course, uh, another aspect associated with this is how to minimize the generation of the byproducts. So this is basically a process control where uh, the at the industry level, the process has to be in place so that we can minimize the generation of the waste. Some work is being done in this context also by several researchers. So this is another aspect which gets added to the uh, subject, environmental geotechnology. I will continue with the list of uh, the topics which have to be explored by the experts. Uh, IoT is becoming a very big subject in the realm of environmental geotechnology. AI ML, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning uh, are very good tools which have to be mastered by us so that we can solve the problems. Sensor-based data generation, particularly in the case of landfill segregation of the material. Uh, what are the emerging issues, climate change, how AI ML can be utilized for this? A classic example is that uh, machine learning can be utilized for detection of the cracks in the soil mass. And there's a recent paper which we have published along with the um, friends from China. Um, and of course, the expert systems where you have big data analysis, which can be done. So I'm sure you must be realizing the realm of environmental geotechnology is becoming, becoming big, big and big and big, bigger. We need several people to work on these topics. Then only the subject is going to get completed, which is ever evolving. Uh, talking about the coupled phenomena, very challenging aspects to deal with, but you will realize that coupled phenomena, uh, which environmental geotechnologists talk about, would include the energy geotechnics. Suppose if I want to extract gases from the landfill, methane gas, or methane gas from the methane gas hydrates. Uh, for some of you who are not aware of these words, please do not get uh, discouraged. You can Google these terms. Uh, there are several papers being published by several people all over the world. Just type it on net and you will find out what hydrates are. So these are basically clathrates of methane trapped in the water beneath the seabed, exposed to very high pressure and low temperature conditions. All right. Now the challenge is, and where geomechanics plays a very important role and environmental geotechnology is bound to play a very important role is how to extract gas. And this could be done by either heating, depressurization, or maybe multi-phase geomodeling. So another interesting topic is uh, CH4 CO2 replacement and geothermal energy, enhanced oil recovery, and so on. 
until some time back these topics used to be uh, the i should not use the term monopoly but these topics were studied by petroleum geophysicists but now the time has come where these problems have to be uh, discussed by keeping in view the micro mechanics models uh, which are going to govern the geomechanics of the system so imagine if you are trying to extract the gases or the fluids from a porous media all right the simple answer is what's going to happen subsidence so this subsidence is if it has to be stopped we have to realize how some gas or the fluid can be replaced without the geomaterial or the porous matrix losing its entity that's what the replacement is geothermal would be how to extract heat which is because of the crustal energy by passing some fluid through the rocks deep geothermal reservoirs enhanced oil recovery most of the oil which gets stuck in the porous media or the reservoirs because of its very high viscosity and density cannot be extracted so if i can inject a fluid which is at very high temperature or a gas or if i can heat the entire system i can extract the fluid or the oil heavy oil so you must be realizing these topics are going to be the game changer for our subject uh, that is the environmental geotechnology here i would like to give you one example of uh, how multi phase geomaterials concept can be utilized in dealing with the situations and before that i would like to give you one more example of couple phenomena which is uh, how the climate is getting impacted that everybody is aware of uh, we, nowadays everybody is talking about uh, net zero or carbon reduction from the environment so this is where the terms which are being coined are carbon capture utilization and storage ccus or ccu that is carbon capture and utilization now you must be wondering that how come uh, geotechnical engineers civil engineers environmental geotechnologists are going to talk about these issues very interesting way to look at this would be i may capture the carbon from the atmosphere i can push it or i can store it in the soil mass or in the industrial by products i may neutralize them okay and this is one of the ways to utilize this and store this the another way could be i will sequester the carbon dioxide in the subsurface for some beneficial purpose so if you look at the mechanics which governs this type of situations uh most of the time this multi phase geomechanics becomes very handy to understand the whole process of uh, you know uh, the mechanisms which are prevailing in these type of systems some of some of us have uh, worked in the field of unsaturated soils so unsaturated state of the soil itself is because of environmental factors let's say high temperatures pervious material or even the impervious materials so this is going to be the influence of heating to the geomaterial which is causing a state of material which is unsaturated so in my opinion unsaturated state of the soils is also because of environmental factors and this is where we talk about osmotic suction metric suction and we have talked about soil water characteristic curve the time has come to redefine this as i'll be discussing after some time and once we are talking about unsaturated soils we would be interested in knowing how contaminant migration takes place through such deposits through such soils how current migration takes place how heat migration takes place and so on and then another aspect would be what about the geomechanical response of unsaturated soils so if i would like to say that this is the system or the matrix of the material where m corresponds to the uh, minerals uw corresponds to unfrozen water content and g corresponds to the gases 
I have introduced another concept of frozen water and unfrozen water. That means the climatic conditions are so adverse or so extreme that the poor solution or the water which was present in the soil has got frozen either fully or partially. So I'm sure you must be realizing this is the another component which is getting added up to the realm of environmental geotechnology. So how geomechanical properties like compressibility, shear strength, wave velocities, deformation characteristics are going to get changed is becoming very important to study because most of the deposits in nature are not saturated, they are unsaturated. Now, if I superimpose the effect of extreme pressure temperature conditions and microbial activities, this also falls under the category of multi-phase geomaterials. How? Look at this. Extreme pressure temperature conditions might result in the freezing of soils. And freezing of soils is because of the sub-zero temperatures, where the cryosections are going to develop. So earlier, in case of unsaturated soils, uh, we talked about soil water characteristic curve. When the soils get frozen, uh, what we will be talking about is, or what we require is, uh, soil freezing characteristic curve. The way SWCC gave you all the indications of permeability, unsaturated hydraulic conductivity, strength parameters, heat migration, contaminant transport, you know, the whole gamut of activities. The same thing can be done with SFCC, provided we can develop this. So what you'll have to do is, SFCC is a relationship between how much ice is getting formed at a given temperature. And this is going to be a game changer. Because freeze thaw cycles, if I want to study and how the material loses its characteristics or the mechanical strength, uh, I have to study SFCC. So from a mineral, unfrozen water, gas system, I have introduced another phase of the material in the matrix of the soil, which is the frozen water content. I'm sure those of you who are working in this area would realize that the complication has got increased and you need to develop instrumentation so that first of all, you can differentiate between what is the fraction of the soil which is getting affected due to very high pressure, low temperature conditions and water remains unfrozen as well as certain water becomes frozen. It's a typical hydrates, which everybody is trying to develop mathematically or doing experiments and so on. So this is what actually I wanted to bring to your notice that the multi-phase geomaterials are going to be a game changer in the subject environmental geotechnology, direct influence of environmental conditions on the porous media. So gas hydrate bearing sediments are a good example of this high pressure, low temperature, SWCC will get changed to SCC, that is soil clathrate characteristic curve. Where it is going to be used? Fluid transport, water transport through hydrated soil mass. If I want to replace methane with CO2, CH4 CO2 replacement, this is what can be utilized. If you want to study because of this process, what happens to the subsidence of the ocean bed? We can develop models. So this is the micro mechanics behind the multi-phase systems, which is what people are trying to learn. Just quickly, I like to introduce this concept of SFCC, uh, which is becoming an integral part of uh, modern day See, I'm using the term modern day environmental geotechnology, though geotechnology, environmental geotechnology itself is a new term. Uh, but uh, those of us who have worked in this area for a sufficient uh, time are realizing that this subject has to go beyond uh, the constraints of the present day circumstances. And we have to think about the issues which are really bothering 
uh, scientists and the planners and the society as such. So the mineral surface, which I have shown over here, and this is the frozen water. And in between, there's an unfrozen water. So what's going to happen is these three phases are going to interact with each other. And how do you quantify this? Cryosuction. So if you can measure the suction which is developing because of the situation, that is what is going to help us a lot. Unfortunately, I'm sure you will realize that measuring cryosuction is not very easy. But then we have to devise techniques to measure this. So as I said, uh, soil freezing characteristic curve is nothing but uh, on y-axis you can see the volume of uh, unfrozen water when the temperatures are environmental. And when the temperatures are sub-environmental or sub-zero, there's a drop in the water content, unfrozen water content, because the water gets frozen and hence the volume of ice content increases. So this relationship is known as SFCC. If I know this relationship, I can uh, find out what type of geomechanical characteristics are going to be pertaining to a given state of geomaterial, particularly fluid conductivity, compressibility, shear strength, thermal properties, how heat migration takes place and so on. All these properties can be uh, really handled. Another complication in the system would be uh, when we are talking about situation like hydrates. A similar situation can be created where nucleation of mineral is taking place because of neutralization when the porous media or the geomaterial happens to be hyperactive and I'm injecting a gas which reacts with this mineralization. So truly speaking, clathrate formation, mineralization are equivalent things. And at pore level, the pores are getting choked. So under these circumstances, where we have a mineral surface, we have unclathrate water, we have CH4, CO2 gas, we have clathrate water. What is the mechanics which is going on between these four phases of the matter is what uh, we would like to study. Fine. So, uh, several challenges, as I said, in case of the cryosuction measurement exists over here. Uh, we have to redefine the concept of effective stress in case of multiphase geomechanics. We have to devise some techniques so that I can identify how much clathrate formation has taken place, how much water remains frozen, how much water remains unfrozen, and so on. I hope you are realizing the challenges which are lying ahead uh, in this context. And uh, though it's very fascinating, but it's very challenging. Another big subtopic, uh, which in my opinion is going to be uh, a trendsetter in the days to come is uh, biogeo interface in multi-phase porous media the bioactivity and I'm sure many of us are working in this area and very good papers are being published. I'm so happy that people are trying to study what type of bioactivity occurs in the geomaterials by simulating it in the laboratory and the field conditions and by mathematical modeling also. So the biogeo interface is something which is uh, microbial, bacterial. MICP, you must have heard of, which involves biomolecular mechanics uh, to deal with, you know, uh, microbial induced calcite precipitation, biogas formation. One of the good examples of biogas formation is methane hydrates. Bacteria produces uh, the methane gas and that gas trapped at very high pressure, low temperature condition, hydrates get formed, biofilms. And uh, ultimately, whether the geomaterial is getting 
degraded because of decomposition, microbial decomposition, or it might be getting upgraded. So look at the sands. If I want to cohesce the two sand particles, what I can do? I can take help of the bacteria and I can create a, you know, a sort of a glue or adhesion uh, which is coming from the bacterial activity. Truly speaking, this is a contact mechanics problem and uh, people should be working in this area. Now, what is biosuction, which I was talking about? So, biosuction is a new perspective. Uh, earlier, we were talking about the metric suction, osmotic suction, uh, because of the capillary forces or the presence of salts. Now, when biosuction comes in the system, uh, this has to be defined by the microbial activity. Unfortunately, uh, not much studies have been done, uh, to my knowledge, on quantification of biosuction. Though one of my students has worked in an area and we have shown that uh, there is a definite difference between metric suction, osmotic suction and biosuction, uh, but there is a long way to go. And this seems to be a very interesting area uh, for the neo geoenvironmental technology. Plus, add to this the cryosuction, which is what we were discussing about. So, as far as the suction measurement is concerned, rather than having two components, I think the need of the hour is to define four components. Matrix suction, osmotic suction, biosuction, and cryosuction. Then only we can study the response of the material in the best possible manner. Uh, another interesting field in which uh, some of us can work and are working is uh, monuments and the old structures. Conservation, durability, weathering actions. You know, how to rehabilitate such type of structures is a big challenge. Uh, this is where the new materials can be utilized to overcome the weathering process, making the system more durable, reducing the weathering action and so on. This is a very hot topic now, pandemics, disaster and destruction management. I hope you can understand pandemic we have just gone through disaster and destruction, what is happening right now, we must be realizing in a big way. And I feel that uh, environmental geotechnologies uh, can play a very important role in uh, mitigating this. Uh, pathogenic contaminants, barrier systems, geohazard mitigation, forensic engineering, uh, which are becoming more socio-techno, legal, political aspects, international politics also, all right? Uh, this is what is going to be the realm of uh, geoenvironmentalist and of course mining mineral processing and geoenvironment uh, which has been studied by researchers the concepts are quite clear and people are talking about how industrial byproducts can be utilized for controlling the acid mine drainage uh, what to do with the mine tailings how to suppress the dust and the leaching which are coming out of these uh, processing units and the stacks. One more area uh, which comes to my mind is infrastructure on challenging and geomaterials in the deposits. And this is where uh, land creation is very well known to everybody. Uh, you know, the land reclamation by using the dress sediments. But now the time has come where the dress sediments are also not found fit for reclamation process. And the reason is uh, mostly they are organic and contaminated. So a big challenge is if you are dealing with the organic dress sediments, which are contaminated also, how will you handle them? How will you create land out of it? How will you create infrastructure? Quite challenging task. And of course, uh, the sky is the limit to imagination. And uh, I always think that uh, 
cold region geomechanics, which many of us have done, and that the cold region is frozen soils. No wonder in days to come, environmental geotechnologists will also be <coughs> talking about the lunar mechanics and Martian mechanics, which is going to be the extraterrestrial. So this is what uh, to my mind comes to the future of environmental geotechnology. Just very quickly, I'd like to show you what are our activities, initiatives. Presently, my research group is mostly involved into the climate change, which encompasses most of the things which I have discussed some time back. And the genesis of these ideas is COP26, where the United Nations Climate Change Conference, uh, which took place in Glasgow in 2021, uh, motivated us to take up these studies. The terrestrial domain bulk utilization of industrial byproducts, waste material, and municipal bioproducts for sustainable development. So we can valorize. Valorization is value addition. If I can take a waste material and if I can create value out of it by some process, this is what is valorization. So fly ash, red mud, slags, phosphogypsum, anything which comes to your mind could be a part of this series. And what I can do is I can create man-made soils by neutralizing these byproducts or by bio-augmenting it with the help of CCUS, carbon capture neutralization storage. In this context, uh, many of us have successfully conducted laboratory tests and upscaling is being attempted. Now, this is where a very good interface can be created between industry and academia, uh, who will capture, bottle, transport the CO2 from where, the point source, how would you decide the storage sites, and ultimately where such experiments can be done in the big way. And the second category is the subsurface domain or the geological you know, storage. We are what I just discussed about the methane gas production using CH4 CO2 replacement, which is a good example of carbon capture utilization and storage. Hydrate-based storage of the CO2 in marine sediments, uh, which is a good example of carbon capture and storage. Uh, CO2 enabled geothermal energy extraction which is both uh, CCU and CCUS and of course enhanced oil recovery. So this is where actually we are working right now and my urge to the researchers would be to lay the foundations of these subtopics in the realm of environmental geotechnology. <clears throat> And of course, in this list, uh, geomechanics of carbon dioxide sequestration in deep saline aquifers also falls, where laboratory investigations are to be conducted and uh, upscaling is to be done. So there's a big task in our hands. I think uh, you can realize this. This is something which is related to the sustainability. Uh, you know, my research group is working in this area where we use all sorts of waste which is coming out from the municipality which i call as uh, mbps and industrial byproducts ibps so we want to replace cement and concrete by binders which are coming out of the landfills and of course uh, the filler material which is coming from the industry so this is going to be a sort of a neo concrete, man-made concrete, where the components of the concrete are not naturally occurring, anthropogenically used material or created material. Uh, this is also the future of uh, environmental geotechnology is in my opinion. And this is one of the ways to come out of the situation which is prevailing uh, presently in, in the in the society. If you are thinking of biomining, uh, the best form would be uh, use the components and create 
different types of composites uh, which can be utilized for various infrastructure development. So I'm now heading very close to uh, end of my talk. And just to summarize, geomaterials are exposed to various loading conditions. All right. And when I say loadings, these are the stresses. And these stresses could be mechanical, chemical, thermal, electrical, radiological, biological, which has been studied slightly less. And then the question is how geomaterials are going to respond to these stresses, fluxes, stimuli. You remember I started with the term external stimuli. So external stimuli is nothing but the stresses. And these stresses could be mechanical, chemical, thermal, electrical, radiological, biological. So people have to work on how to create characterization schemes and how these materials are going to respond to the environmental forces. This would be a holistic geomaterial characterization utilization scheme. And this is where I use the term neo geoenvironmental engineering for sustainable development. Again, I would like to emphasize geoenvironmental engineering or environmental geotechnology itself is very new. But we are now thinking of much ahead and trying to evolve neo geoenvironmental engineering. And that is going to be a panacea for uh, sustainable development. These are some pictures from a laboratory where I'm sitting right now and talking to uh, all of you. As I said, the cryogenic conditions cannot be unfortunately stimulated much in the laboratory. So there are limited efforts, but the time has come where people have to move out of their laboratory and go to the field and execute these experiments to show their uh, validity. This is going to be something which is a new idea. Well, the torchbearers are my research group who keep me quite motivated to take up these studies, which I'm sure you must have realized is not a easy walk. It's a tough process to learn. But I'm very thankful to my researchers and the research groups uh, for uh, educating me on these very intricate topics like uh, gas hydrates. Uh, Lijith has finished his PhD, he has submitted his PhD and uh, is the most ideal candidate for postdoc's position now. Uh, my another student is Mr. Goli, who is working on biomine materials. He's about to finish his PhD in another one, one year's time. Then Pratsen Singh, who is working on rubber waste utilization. Uh, we are trying to create a subject known as uh, waste mechanics, which I'm sure many of you are working on. But what is the mechanics of the rubber waste and why it becomes an ideal material for present day infrastructure development is we are trying. Then Mr. Rao is working on CH4 CO2 replacement. Another student of mine, Pakra, is working on geothermal energy from abandoned oil and gas wells. One of my students, Kamran, is working on CCUS in industrial byproducts. Another student is working on uh, enhanced oil recovery by using CCUS concept, Jashri. And of course, my another student is working on AIML in uh, geoenvironmental engineering. And of course, I would like to say my special thanks to Dr. Arif Mohammed, who finished his PhD and master's with me. And right now he's working as a postdoc at Cardiff University with Peter Clelal. And uh, during the presentation, this presentation, creation and making of the slides, uh, his help and discussion was very, very helpful to me. So I sincerely appreciate his involvement. Thank you very much. And for a very patient hearing, uh, your wholehearted support for the success of this mission is solicited. The mission is to take environmental geotechnology to a new frontier. And that is what the way forward is. Your suggestions are most welcome for our betterment. And please 
uh, I'll be very happy if you would like to discuss or ask questions or give your feedback. You can utilize my email address. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor San, for the wonderful talk and uh, uh, bring us many new ideas. So, is there anybody have a question? We have uh, some time to have a discuss. Any questions? Hello, um, Professor DNS. Can I have a question? Oh, sure, please. Um, so, um, in, you know, uh, environmental geotechnics uh, is uh, quite similar to some uh, uh, area subjects like environmental science and engineering. Uh, so, for example, um, but for the topic of soil contamination and remediation, both environmental geotechnics and the other similar areas they are doing uh, researches in this same uh, topic. So uh, my question is, uh, what uh, our environmental geotechnique researchers can do to distinguish from other similar areas? So what, what uh, we can do to do something, can we do something um, like super real or can we do something uh, unique to, to distinguish from other subjects uh, for the same? Yeah, I'm very happy that you have asked this question, uh, uh, procession. Uh, see, the point is environmental geotechnology uh, basically tells us that we should come out from our compartments. So it's nothing like that I am doing this and he is doing this or she is doing this. You must be realizing that what our subject is trying to address is the contemporary issues. Solutions are different, problems are same. Environmental geotechnology, as I said, is still the porous media is our, you know, uh, main thing. How this porous media is getting influenced because of the environmental factors is a major question, which I'm sure uh, other subjects are not really concentrating on. So our domain is mostly the porous matrix, which might undergo degradation, upgradation, decomposition, dissolution, mineralization, creation, formation, all adjectives. All right. So, I mean, this is what my understanding about the subject is that whatever happens in the porous matrix, if we study it, should be the realm of future environmental geotechnology. Okay, thank you. My pleasure. Okay. Is there any other questions? Could I ask a question? Oh, yes, please. Okay, so. Uh, so uh, first, uh, thank you very much for your uh, wonderful presentation. Um, I'm quite interested in the, your research about uh, using the plastics in your new materials. So um, the plastic currently is uh, really a big problem because uh, it has already caused some kind of plastic pollution. Um, you make the plastic into the concrete, uh, will there have some kind of second pollution, uh, for example, after a long time of uh, acid rain or etc. What about its uh, uh, leaching performance, something like uh, after quite a long time? Um, could you uh, say something deep about this part? Thank you very much. Okay, um, okay, first I want, I want to uh, let uh, 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 Professor Wang, also this question is pro, uh, from the Professor Wang from Southeast University. Okay, maybe you can you can give a brief introduce, uh, introduction for yourself. Let us to uh, let other people to know you, okay? Oh, thank you, uh, Professor Tang. Yeah, so my, my name is uh, Fei Wang from Southeast University. 
okay so thank you very much uh please uh, remember one thing uh i don't want to use any natural resources for making composites we as a human being have already created so much of waste which has to be consumed which is lying in the landfills so number one thing is that whatever is lying in the landfills should be consumed i do not want to use any fresh aggregates which are coming out from the mining operations all right number 2 uh, putting plastics in concrete which people have done and some studies are still being done is a good idea but i am not actually uh, championing this thing my philosophy is replace cement with another binding material which is the plastic or any sort of binder which is available in the landfill as far as fillers are concerned you use the filler material which is decomposed material which is lying in the landfill so i am happy that you are working in this area i am yet to start my research but my way of looking at the thing is different i want to utilize only waste materials to create the concrete i hope uh, this helps you in understanding uh, what my thoughts are on sustainable development or sustainable infrastructure development by using the industrial based and the municipal solid waste oh thank you very much okay thank you any other question uh, thank you, DNS, for the excellent presentation, and thank you, Professor Tang, for organizing this session. I really enjoyed it. And uh, I have a question. This is Mingliang Zhou from Tongji University. Uh, as we all know, AI and ML has become a trendy research topic in geotechnical research community. I would like to hear your uh, view, based on your experience, how young researchers should uh, utilize this tool or we say it's a concept to advance the environmental geotechnics research. Thank you. Thank you very much for this intriguing question. You are opening up a very big discussion by asking this question. As far as tools are concerned, AI ML are excellent tools. But please remember one thing, Environmental geotechnology deals with several mechanisms and micro mechanisms which happen inside the porous media because of the environmental activities. As long as you can include all these mechanisms in your models, training, learning is very good. Otherwise, these tools which are based on mathematical uh, framework might mislead you. So one of my students who is working in this area, when she talks to me about uh, AI ML, though we have published one paper also very recently with the Ninjang group and uh, CST's group, uh, we have used it for cracking characteristics of soils. I think my opinion would be one has to be very careful in uh, selection of the data and remembering that several mechanisms are going to control the process. You cannot overlook them. All right. So as the situation is, you start with some models, get some approximate results, but keep refining it. And that is what is going to help. Ultimately, we want to create uh, helping hands, helping eyes for us, which are quick to, let us say, segregate the waste to identify the patterns, to tell us the answer very quickly, that if this is the process, what is going to happen? And then what type of material this would be? Something of this sort. Very new area, I am also learning. And if you are a young researcher, please go ahead. Don't forget about the micro mechanisms which are happening in the, in the, in the, in the background or in the material. Fine? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the advice. Okay, any other questions?
Is any other body have a question, please? Hi, Professor uh, Bin Shi, the Hello? president of ISEG. <laughs> yeah, hi. Hi, yes, Professor, Professor uh, Tian Xing. Okay, thank you very much for your uh, time and uh, excellent presentations. Yeah, it's uh, it's wonderful. Yeah, I I I I look with uh, and a lot of the uh, research and uh, study. Uh, students and uh, teachers and everything. I, I will uh, It's uh, really sorry. It's uh, it's uh, COVID nine. It's a uh, blow blockage. Uh, we can uh, communication the uh, face to face. This is uh, it's uh, a pity. So I hope it's uh, in future uh, we can uh, I invite you to visit uh, China and also say. I go to your country so the visit. Okay. Yeah. Do you, have you the uh, COVID nine in the India? Is how about this uh, COVID nine India now? No, Corona in India is not a very alarming stage at, at not at very alarming stage. Everything is very normal, and uh -huh. hope that it will be absolutely normal in another couple of weeks or months. Yeah. So at the recent place and China is uh, now is uh, yeah is uh, more serious. So it's uh, progress. Maybe it's uh, our uh, relation to the environmental geotechnologies. Maybe <laughs> you have uh, some uh, problems. Yeah. Yeah. Pandemics and post-pandemic and post-disaster and man-made disasters are yeah. all becoming a part of our subject. <laughs> Okay. Nice talking thank to you. you. Bye bye. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.